Now I have a particular uh, pleasure and honor uh, to introduce two of the most important people in philanthropy in New England, Bill and Joyce Cummings. After building one of the nation's most successful commercial real estate firms, in 1986, Bill and Joyce took the step of channeling their philanthropic interests toward the creation of a new foundation. Today, the Cummings Foundation is one of the largest in New England, and for more than a quarter century, it has been supporting people and causes right here in Massachusetts. Last year, the Cummings made news by deciding to take an active public stand in becoming one of the now more than 80 signers of the so-called Giving Pledge, pledging to give more than half of their uh, wealth to charitable organizations either during their lifetimes or in their estate. But this really wasn't such a stretch because the Cummings have been giving away about 90 percent uh, of their income for some time. And today they are here to discuss their philosophy of and, uh, and history of philanthropy and some of their more recent uh, work. And they wanted me to tell you that if you want more information about the Cummings Foundation, uh, you should talk to Joel Sweats, who is the executive director of the foundation, uh, and Joyce Viriotis, who is the communications director. And I, I'd ask Joel and Joyce to raise their hands if they would. There they are, right down front. Okay. Now it is my great pleasure and honor to bring up Bill and Joyce Cummings. Thank you. Wow, look at this audience. Thank you very much, Paul, for inviting us to speak and for the kind introduction. Just a week ago today, Bill and I spoke at a Women in Development meeting, and I said then that when I first saw the invitation, I wondered what on earth I could say that would be of interest to such a prominent group. For many years, I was a stay-at-home mom trying valiantly to keep track of four children. I've not worked in a paying position for over 40 years, and I don't think of myself as having anything particularly profound to say. But Bill kept encouraging me and I finally relented. I have not come up with anything more profound than what I said a week ago. <laughs> so if you were at the WID gathering, you can just do business on your smartphones. <laughs> My talk will be pretty much the same. Since becoming known as the first couple in New England to join the Giving Pledge, we have often been asked four questions. Why did you join the Giving Pledge? What do your children think about that? How did you get involved with Holocaust and genocide education? And finally, why did you want to go to Rwanda? I'll address the Giving Pledge questions first and give you a little information about our experiences with the group. Then Bill will share some of our personal and business background. I'll talk about life-changing trips to Israel and Rwanda that really influenced our philanthropy. And Bill will finish up with some information about our foundations. We joined the Giving Pledge for two reasons. The first was to encourage others to get involved with philanthropy and to give what they could. In other words, to set an example. New England, unfortunately, rates pretty low in the rankings of giving throughout the United States. Perhaps we could have just a little influence in that area. The second reason we joined was to make our new grant-making foundations more publicly known, since they will soon be giving some fairly significant funds to needy organizations. We'd been flying under the radar for years. Very few knew about the foundation, because we were really concentrating on building the foundation's endowment base to a sufficient size. We think we have succeeded a little bit with our first reason, encouraging others to give, and we certainly are succeeding with the second. 211 organizations applied for grants in this our first year. What do our children think about the pledge? They are completely comfortable with it. They have all been provided with more than they need, and when asked to donate some of their previously acquired assets back to the foundation, they all did so very willingly. Our children are very different in interest and abilities, and are only peripherally involved in foundation work at this time. 
one daughter, a physician at Columbia Medical Center, and our other daughter, a clinical psychologist in San Francisco, expect to become more involved in the very near future. Our first real contact with the Giving Pledge was last May when we attended its first annual meeting in Tucson, Arizona. Subsequently, last summer, Warren Buffett arranged an extraordinary morning with President Obama in the White House. In February, Bill and our daughter Marilyn and Bill Gates hosted a discussion on philanthropy at our Beacon Grill restaurant in Woburn. And three weeks ago, we attended the second annual Giving Pledge meeting in Santa Barbara. Both annual meetings were really meetings. There wasn't a golf club or a tennis racket in sight. <laughs> but rather a full schedule of both major presentations and small group discussions on how to make philanthropy achieve its greatest potential. Clearly Warren Buffett and Bill and Melinda Gates are the heart and soul of the Giving Pledge. And the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation provides enormous professional research support to many members. Access to that foundation's expertise is a very comforting aspect when a tiny group like ours wants to get involved in a place like Rwanda. We asked Bill Gates about investing, investing philanthropically in Rwanda and were extremely pleased when he assured us that the Gates Foundation research shows Rwanda to be not only very needy, but also in the very top tier as regards its probably long-term stability. Supposedly, there are somewhere between 400 and 600 people or families in the United States who are either billionaires or would be billionaires and thus eligible to join the Giving Pledge, even though some of them had already given away their assets. We are very much in the latter group, having long since turned over more than 90% of all our assets to Cummings Foundation. Now it's Bill's turn. He's going to fill you in on some personal and business backgrounds. Thank you very much, everyone, for your warm welcome here this morning. Joyce and I are certainly delighted with the opportunity to be here and to learn so much more about the Boston Foundation. Joyce grew up in Alabama and attended University of Alabama, graduating in 1962. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, then, and then she came to Boston. She came for a dietetic internship at Massachusetts General Hospital, and at the end of that time, she moved right next door as the hospital dietitian at Massachusetts Eye and Ear Infirmary. Uh, she actually arrived here about 50 years ago, probably this week, when she came from Alabama to Boston, and she never left. My early years were in Medford. Uh, I grew up with my sister and parents in a one-bedroom apartment and had uh, a very good experience in Medford Public Schools and went on from there to Tufts University and graduated in 1958. That was back in the days, folks, when tuition at Tufts University was $320 a semester. <laughs> <laughs> Honest, 320. It was almost a riot when we went up $25 this, <laughs> in my sophomore year. My first real job was in sales peddling Vicks VapoRub. <laughs> For the first full year, I, was, I traveled constantly seven days a week. But at age 21, that really wasn't a bad life. I, I enjoyed it very, very much and had a terrific experience there, even at $60 a week. My second job was with Gortons of Gloucester, and I had the great good fortune to be mentored by the company president. Perhaps some of you here uh, who are of my age bracket would, would have known Bob Kinney, the late Bob Kinney, who went on from Gorton's to become chairman of General Mills. After six years with these two firms, I decided it was time to take off for a while, and I went off to Europe with Arthur Fromer's Europe on $5 a day, which, which really worked back then, and a rail pass. I managed to get to every one of the European capitals, had a, a, uh, just a terrific time for four months, bumping around, went up to, to, to Turkey and down to Cyprus, into Egypt, into Israel for three or four days. Ended up at one point, one of the last trips, one of the last spots on the trip was in Syria, where I 
wasn't very judicious and I took some pictures I shouldn't have taken. Uh, I suddenly had eight or ten Syrian police officers, all of them ready to shoot me if I moved a second. It was a, it was a frightening experience. And I think of it now with all the, that's happening there and realize how, how much more afraid I should have been perhaps. <clears throat> Certainly everything in those days was done tourist class and uh, it is, it's a factor that when we fly, we fly only tourist class today. Back in Boston after that, I purchased a, a barely breathing company. It was a 120 year old company that manufactured Old Medford concentrated fruit punch. And Old Medford fruit punch was, was really the, the first real business that I promoted and it worked out very, very well especially because one of the very first sales that I made was at Massachusetts Eye and Ear Infirmary. <laughs> and didn't I meet Joyce? And Joyce did like the product. She thought it was a, a, appropriate to use in the hospital cafeteria. Uh, Joyce was smart, she was pretty, and she was a great cook, and she had $3,000 in the bank. <laughs> and, and we could put that to good use. Joyce did most of the parenting thereafter for quite a while uh, with our four children. Uh, she has also kept very busy with all sorts of community involvements for a long time and then with Cummings Foundation after 1986. We worked out some pretty innovative ways to get Old Medford Fruit Punch into colleges and universities and eventually had about 400 college accounts in about 20 eastern states and, and uh, until someone else came along at just about the right time and decided a competitor wanted to buy the business. So we, we sold the business and for about 100 times what it originally cost and credited a lot of, a lot of uh, long nights and, and weekends to, to a, a good start for Cummings Properties. That's about the same time we were starting to build commercial buildings in Woburn and that had uh, started off with, the, with an addition to the old Medford building and just kept going. Today Cummings Properties has about 10 million square feet and largely because of old Medford Foods we never had to take out a construction loan. Anytime we had a mortgage we signed for it personally to get a lower rate and managed to always pay them off. Cummings Properties is now a 350 person firm leasing mostly to offices and commercial, commercial users of all sorts, with a lot, of, a lot of medical users, a lot of research facilities, and about 2,500 tenants. Cummings Foundation has always kept a very low profile. Uh, many of you would be familiar a little bit with our two old Medford, our two, excuse me, our two New Horizons assisted living communities, and also uh, with our commitment to a $50 million commitment to the Cummings School of Veterinary Medicine at Tufts. Joyce will tell you a little more now about how the foundation is actually changing. Returning to the most asked questions, how did you get involved with Holocaust and genocide education? In 2009, we went to Israel on a Tufts alumni trip. Near the end of our journey, the group visited Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Museum in Jerusalem. During that visit, we had a life-changing meeting with Holocaust survivor Eliezer Eilon, who was currently Senior Tour Director of the museum. Following our tour of the museum, Eli shared his life experiences as a young teen imprisoned in five different concentration camps. I considered myself fairly well-read, and I thought I knew quite a bit about the Holocaust. But after visiting Yad Vashem and having an opportunity to meet with Ellie, I realized that what I knew was less than a drop in the bucket. Sadly, we learned just yesterday that Ellie died this past week. He had become a good friend and we will miss his presence even though he lived far away. During discussions with others on the tour, we came to three powerful realizations. One, the lessons of the Holocaust and are far too vital to be forgotten or denied. Two, genocides are still occurring around the world. Three, thinking people cannot simply sit quietly and let those genocides happen. 
Several days later, while flying home, we looked at each other and said almost simultaneously, we have to do something. So the first thing we did was bring Ellie to Massachusetts, host him at our home, and arrange for him to speak at Tufts. That was the beginning of the interfaith Cummings Hillel program for Holocaust and genocide education at Tufts University. Ellie's standing room only presentation has been followed by other very meaningful speakers, including Dr. John Saunders, the only Tufts alum who is a Holocaust survivor. And just this past March, Father Patrick Dubois, a French Catholic priest who is working in Eastern Europe to uncover hidden mass graves of Jews killed during the Holocaust. Directed primarily by Tufts students, the program has offered film screenings, discussion groups, and panel discussions by local survivors of contemporary genocides. They also plan annual travel learning opportunities, which this year included a trip to the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C. And the fourth question, why did you go to Rwanda? <laughs> Even before programming began at Tufts, we were asked to provide travel funds for 20 student volunteers to visit Aga Haza Shalom Youth Village, home to 500 orphans of the 1994 genocide. We did provide the funds and have done so now for several years. Each year, Aga Haza Shalom, which means a place to dry one's tears in peace, takes 125 of the most vulnerable teens across Rwanda and brings them to the village where they are given basic necessities along with education and lots of TLC. After hearing our visit to this remarkable place affected the Tufts students so deeply, we knew we had to see it for ourselves, so we traveled to Rwanda this past January. The experience was well worth the 20-hour flight and we were extremely impressed with all the village is doing to help raise the next generation that will work toward healing the badly scarred country. We also visited Kigali Memorial Center founded by Dr. James Smith of Aegis Trust. The memorial, a tribute to the more than 800,000 Rwandans slaughtered in 1994, reinforced our belief that we could not sit and do nothing. One of our traveling companions for the 12-day trip was a physician with ties to Partners in Health, and he arranged for us to visit two of the organization's hospitals. We were so impressed by all the staff and the work they are doing in areas where real medical care was otherwise practically non-existent. I cannot possibly share all of our experiences, happy stories, very sad stories, funny experiences, physically challenging times, etc. But if you want to know more about our trip, you can visit our website, CummingsFoundation.org. That's Skip Fuller up there in the center for some of you who would know Dr. Fuller. Oh, yes. Um, after returning home, I wrote an extensive report about our journey, and it is posted on our website. But I will finish up with two examples of how caring people can really make a difference. We learned that Aga Hazar Shalom needs more and better medical care than it has received in the four years since it opened. At the same time, PAH in Rwanda has been looking for ways to expand its agricultural program. Through our encouragement, PIH sent a delegation to the village and returned excited by what was seen and learned. Although the village has a small farm, it has many more acres that can be used for agricultural purposes. Plans for a fine reciprocal effort of medical care and food supply are already underway. Being able to assist in this cooperation between such two extraordinary institutions made us very happy. We then learned of a village student who had a tumor on his leg. The local doctor wanted to resolve the problem with an amputation. Then when another tumor was found on his other leg, the doctor determined that he would amputate both legs at the same time. Fortunately for the student, the village was able to send him outside the country, intervene in time where he was able to receive a much less aggressive cure. After hearing stories like this one, it was a very easy decision for us to pledge funds to build Rwanda's first cancer infusion treatment center. We feel this center, when it opens in 2013, will likely be one of our most rewarding ph philanthropic efforts. And now Bill is going to finish up and tell you a little bit more about our foundations and what we hope to accomplish through them. 
Joyce and I are, of course, very aware of how much Boston Foundation has been doing for decades to improve life in Massachusetts. When Cummings Foundation just completed its first round of grants to 60 local institutions, your giving commons submissions were just not an option at that point. We very much hope to participate, however, with Boston Foundation in promoting its efficiency and effectiveness for both grant makers and certainly for grant recipients in future years. Cummings Foundation does have significant assets, but almost nothing by way of the staff and the experience and, the, and all the infrastructure that Boston Foundation uses so effectively. Always an operating foundation before, Cummings Foundation now has two new grant-making affiliates. Institute for World Justice is the first. It will reach very much afar, concentrating most of its attention in Rwanda. Institute for World Justice will also support American efforts to combat future genocides through organizations like the United States Memorial Holocaust Museum and other institutions and organizations promoting uh, Holocaust and genocide education. One World Boston, on the other hand, will be a very local organization concentrating on the tri-county area of eastern Middlesex, southern Essex, and Suffolk counties. One World Boston will provide support in areas primarily from which our funds were originally derived and from where, when where most of our coming staff and clients tend to live. The very diverse recipients of the first 60 recent grants of $100,000 each are appearing on the screen now. These mostly multi-year grants are also posted on the One World Boston section of CummingsFoundation.org. As you'll notice there, most of these One World Boston grants tend to be to smaller and very local organizations. And I'm certainly impressed with the, the number of such organizations that are represented here and are served so well by Boston Foundation and have been for so long. The ongoing income from all of the Foundation's assets will be used to support these two new grant makers, while the Foundation's own endowment is being capped at a billion dollars. Joyce and I first fully realized 30 years ago that no one can really own real estate. We just can't really own the land or any kind of real estate. Even though we may hold some kind of legal title, how can we really consider ourselves anything more than caretakers of the land? This seems particularly so in, dis in disposing of real property such as we've been doing during our own lifetimes. A phrase often heard in some fundraising circles is about people being asked to give until it hurts. A far better thought, we think, is people giving until they can really feel good about it. In closing, I am sure that virtually every person in this hall would quickly join us in condemning racism and bigotry in intolerance and injustice. These are the things Cummings Foundation will work on, we hope to meaningfully reduce. Thank you. Thank you, thank you.